Friends, welcome to the fourth lecture on module 2, which is focusing on accident modeling, risk assessment, and management. In this lecture in HSC course, we will talk about explosion release modeling. Let us quickly understand what do we mean by explosion. Explosions are generally indicative measures of sound noise and sudden disruption of objects at the site. Explosion means violent bursting or driving out of objects with a destructive force. So, therefore, an important concept in explosion is that what is the quantum of energy being released when a material or a chemical mixture is exploded. So, there are two types of waves which causes explosion, one is called as a blast wave, the other one is called as a shock wave. Let us see what we mean by a blast wave. Blast waves are caused due to sudden change in pressure, density, temperature and velocity. It has a very large value of gradients of pressure, temperature and velocity because the rise or the change is very steep. This wave cannot travel progressive with the same constant jump. Therefore, friends it is easy and it is advantageous for us to understand that blast waves are decreasing in nature and will decline as the time progresses. However, if the blast wave is supported by an external source, then the continuous progression of this wave is possible with the same intensity. Therefore, it requires otherwise a continuous strengthening agency to progress in the positive direction with the same amount of amplitude. What are the characteristics of blast waves? Blast waves essentially consist of shock wave front. This progressively happens when the shock wave is projected. Now, the question comes what do you mean by shock waves? Shock waves are caused due to abrupt change in pressure, temperature, density and velocity. It releases impulsive energy very fast. The speed of shock wave is much greater than that of sound. Therefore, it travels much faster in the medium when reaches and creates destruction as early as possible. Blast wave consists of shock wave front which enables it to travel faster. That is the reason why blast waves also travel faster because the wave front of blast waves is a shock wave front. Let us quickly see what are the possible types of explosions which can occur in a chemical plant. Types of explosions are generally categorized according to the mode of energy they are releasing, naturally occurring explosion, intentional explosion, accidental explosion. The naturally occurring explosions are can be seen as examples that arise from lightning, volcanic eruptions etcetera. The thunder heard after lightning is due to the decayed pressure of powerful blast wave which is arising from the lightning. The rapid release of hot gases and large quantities of steam due to volcano eruption forms a blast wave. There are the second category called intentional explosions. They can be further classified as constructive explosions, explosions for engineering applications and destructive applications. Constructive applications can be for blasting of rocks. They are essentially required when you construct tunneling, road construction, dam and bridge pier construction etcetera. You may have to blast the rocks for effective deeper foundations. Therefore, we also do blasting which is also a form of explosion which is essentially meant for constructive applications. There are however, advanced techniques available which are used in the recent past for controlled blasting. So, essential problem in case of such blasting is the free throw away material in the atmosphere which can cause damage to the people around which can also cause destruction to the objects located around. Now, controlled blasting can prevent the flying of objects which is occurring because of this blasting which is generally practiced in modern construction techniques these days. You can also do explosions for engineering applications. This may occur in the combustion chambers of internal combustion engines. 
it happens when the engine is not properly tuned technically this is what we call as engine knocking. The energy in such situations are released during rocket launching is also a time of explosive which is for engineering applications. The third category is what we call destructive explosion. There are man made disasters which are otherwise terrorist attacks which are examples of explosions. This results in rapid release of energy which is from the chemicals which are exploded which are located in the place of explosions. There are something called accidental explosions. This takes place due to rapid and significant release of energy from the substances. It occurs due to large inventory of flammable materials, leak and oil spills etcetera. This is a very common type of explosion which generally happens in oil and gas production and drilling platforms. Essentially the hazardous substances or the inventory of hazardous substances present in the platform or the offshore drilling rig leads to such explosions. Explosions can also be classified further based on condensed phase thermal explosion, gas phase confined explosion, unconfined explosion, boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion what we call blevy, dust explosion, physical explosion and atmospheric dispersion which is also a form of or a kind of explosion. Nuclear explosion is of course a rare phenomena, but however the disaster caused because of these explosions are very catastrophic and the societal damage arising from such explosions are very severe. As we just now saw in a case of explosion it has got two kinds of waves the blast wave and the shock wave. The shock wave enables the blast wave to proceed further in the progressive direction in terms of time. So, in both the cases the most important quantity which is to be measured is the energy released which is given with the equation shown in the slide. The energy released in explosion by a blast wave is given by this equation where rho naught is the density of the material, R s is the blast wave velocity, T of course the time and C is a constant which depends on the energy and density of the material. Let us quickly see the accident statistics of any process system. Chemical process systems contain substantial hazard material in the form of fire and explosion. On the other hand, the inventory which is stocked in the plant or the chemical process industries do have tendency of catching either fire or they can result in explosions. Three common chemical plant accidents generally are identified in the literature as fire, explosion and toxic release. However, in the last lectures we understood how to model the toxic release an example of chemical exposure index which results in the ERPG guidelines and also the hazard distances has been given as example problems in the last lectures. Fire and explosion are one of the destructive and undesirable outcome of chemical plant accidents. If you look at the statistics available in the literature, the literature shows that essentially chemical plant accidents has received incidences in the past mainly from explosions, toxic release and fire. However, accidents caused in chemical plants because of other sources except these three are highly negligible. So, these are the major three sources of accidents which generally responsible for destructive phenomena in chemical plants. Therefore, to model them let us try to understand few terminologies and basics of fire and explosions. Fire is a rapid exothermal oxidation of any ignited fuel. This fuel fortunately can be either a solid or a liquid or even in a vaporous form. The vapor and liquid fuel are of course easier to ignite compared to the solid ones. When it catches fire it releases energy slowly. There is no sudden release of energy in case of fire. But however, the unfortunate part is fire can also result in 
explosions or result from explosions. On the other hand, fire and explosion are integrated or interconnected, you cannot separate them. Whenever there is a fire, it may result in an explosion or the explosion can be derived because of fire. If you look at the explosion characteristics, the explosion is a rapid expansion of gases resulting in a rapidly moving pressure or a shock wave. The expansion can either be from mechanical or chemical reactions of the inventory materials. The explosion damage is caused by pressure wave or a shock wave. The explosion contradictory to fire releases energy rapidly and it can result from fire. So, as I said fire and explosion are interrelated, this process cannot be explicitly separated. However, fire releases energy slowly whereas, explosion releases energy rapidly. Let us quickly see from this table what are the different elements that can cause fire, what are the types of these elements which can result in fire and let us see quickly some of the examples on this list. If you look at the fire element, fuel as one of the fire element, it can be either liquid, it can be solid or it can be gaseous state. For liquid, the examples can be gasoline, acetone, ether, pentane etcetera. Solids which can cast fire as a fuel is plastics, wooden dust, fibrous material and metal particles, whereas the gaseous states acetylene, propane, carbon monoxide, hydrocarbons etcetera can be fuel which can cause fire. If you look at oxidizers which are also available in three different states as solid, liquid and gas, gaseous can be oxygen, fluorine and chlorine, liquids can have examples as hydrogen peroxide, nitric acid, perchloric acid etcetera and of course, solids can be metal peroxides and ammonium nitrate which are classically few examples which are very common in hydrocarbon industries. The third important element which is responsible for fire is the ignition source. The source of ignition for causing fire can occur by a spark on the top side of the plant, it can be flames, it can be even static electricity or it can be heat which can cause exothermal reaction from the chemical inventories available on the plant. Now, the essential question comes after understanding basic characteristics of fire and explosion. How can we prevent a fire or an explosion accident? Now, if you look at this triangle which is shown on the screen now, this is famously known as fire triangle. This fire triangle has got three arms. One is the oxygen arm, the other is the fuel arm, the third one is the ignition source. Hypothetically friends, if any one of this arm is not present, it will not result in fire. But unfortunately, if you remember and understand a offshore or a process plant cannot sustain a process industry without any one of these three arms because we need oxygen in a plenty for chemical reaction. Of course, fuel is a participating element in any chemical process industry and of course, how carefully you do ignition sources as shown in the last slide cannot be completely avoided. They can be only inspected, mitigated, rectified and managed comfortably. Therefore, a fire triangle which is hazardous scenario in any process industry will always exist live in the industry because the arms of the triangle can never be forbidden for any specific practical reasons. Therefore, fire and explosion accidents can be prevented hypothetically if you know the knowledge of the following. You must clearly know the fire and explosion characteristics of the inventory material available in the plant. The nature of fire and explosion process, you should also know different procedures to reduce the fire and explosion hazards. As I insisted, if you look at this triangle, if you are able to get rid of any one of the arm of the triangle, fire and explosion can be prevented in the industry. Therefore, let us try to understand some basic characteristics of fire and explosion of the materials which can result from fire and explosion. For every material which can cause or result a fire and explosion, you have something called auto ignition temperature abbreviated as AIT in the literature. 
it is nothing but a fixed temperature above which material may not require any external ignition at all for combustion. Every material has a characteristic temperature which is an auto ignition the term itself makes you to understand it does not require any external ignition source at all. Even in the absence of ignition source if the temperature in the process industry goes higher than AIT of the inventory material stocked in the plant the material can catch fire. The second important characteristic of flammable materials is called flash point. It is the lowest temperature at which liquid gives up enough vapor to maintain a continuous flame. Please understand all these terminologies are related to operational temperature in a given plant where you have no control because the temperature is a continuous changing process in a given system. Flash point is the lowest temperature at which the liquid will give up enough vapor which can keep the fire or the continuous flame. There are something called flammability limits for any given material. There are two limits called lower flammability limit and upper flammability limit abbreviated as LFL and UFL respectively. LFL is a limit below which the mixture will not burn because the mixture will become too lean. UFL is a limit upper limit above which the mixture will not burn because the mixture will be too rich. So, there is a range of vapor concentration which could result in combustion of any material and this range is given between the lower flammability and upper flammability limits of any given material. As I said in the fire triangle one of the important arm is the present of oxygen. So, there is something called limiting oxygen concentration which is called LOC in the literature. This is the minimum oxygen concentration below which the combustion is not possible with any fuel mixture. So, on the other hand hypothetically friends if your temperature is not reaching above AIT and if you are controlling the external ignition source and if you are able to maintain the oxygen concentration below the limiting oxygen concentration value of any flammable material obviously you can design the system which will not have any fire accident at all. But unfortunately chemical process is a continuous scheme the temperature variation is not under the control in the process. Therefore, there is always a possibility that AIT may be reached in a given process scheme or oxygen concentration certainly will be above the LOC which can initiate fire because the material will not catch fire if it is below the minimum oxygen concentration. In the literature the LOC is expressed generally as percentage of oxygen it is sometimes called MOC that is minimum oxygen concentration or MSOC which is maximum safe oxygen concentration. Having said this let us quickly see what would be the consequence of a shock wave and the blast wave in terms of its characteristics. Shock wave is an abrupt pressure wave which moves through a gas medium. Shock wave in open air is generally followed by wind. The combined shock wave and wind is called as a blast wave. The pressure increase in shock wave is so rapid that the process is mostly adiabatic. It may result in something called over pressure. Over pressure is a pressure on an object as a result of an impacting shock wave. Let us quickly see this particular figure which is shown in the slide. The figure plots the variation of temperature versus flammable concentration and there are two limits marked in the y axis which is lower flammability and upper flammability limits within which or between which the liquid or the fuel remains flammable beyond which and below which the fuel is not flammable that is why we are marked as non flammable beyond this region. However, for increase in temperature the flammable limits keeps on increasing it is very unfortunate at higher temperatures you will see that the range of flammability of the material is higher. But however, if you are able to maintain the temperature within auto ignition then in that case the flammable region 
can be limited only to the zone because beyond which auto ignition will not be present therefore the fuel will not catch fire. So this figure shows you the range of flammability of liquid and gases as I said the gas will become flammable beyond a specific point which is called as the flash point. Now I want to obtain the flammability characteristic of given liquid. The equation shown in the slide will help you to estimate the flammability of a given liquid provided the constants A, B, C etc. are known to me from the table. Let us see what are these constants. Liquids can be estimated for the flammability characteristics essentially the lower flammability and upper flammability and the flash point using the equation. Mathematically it is calculated using boiling point relationship where A, B and C are constants available in the literature chemical engineering handbook for a given mixture. Tf is the flash point, Tb is the boiling point both the values in kelvins. Of course the constants are only A, B, C, A, B and C this is an exponential power it is not a constant it is E power exponential power of this value whereas Tf is a flash point and Tb is the boiling point of the given liquid. Now for different kinds of liquids in hydrocarbon industry the table gives you approximately the A, B, C constant values for hydrocarbons, alcohols, acids, ethers, sulfur, halogen, aldehydes you have the constants A, B, C which has been estimated essentially from an open cup or a closed cup method. So this table is available in standard chemical engineering handbook for different kinds of chemical groups for which these constants are readily available in the literature. Once these constants are known you can easily compute the flash point of the liquid even though experimentally this can be also computed directly by an open cup or a closed cup method. Once you know the flash point the next important characteristic will be the flammability range. So I must have the LFL and UFL values of the given mixture or a given vapor and gases. Flammability limits for vapor are determined experimentally in a specially closed vessel apparatus. Flammability limits for mixture of gases and vapor are given by the equations shown below whereas if you know the flammability limits of every liquid or a mixture participating in the mixture then if you know the concentration of Yi where Yi is the mole fraction of the ith component on a combustible basis and N is the summation which is the number of combustible species available in the mixture. LFL stands for the low flammability limit of the ith component whereas the ith component of the fuel is present both in fuel as well as in air. You can also work on the LFL and UFL ranges directly from the flammability limit behavior. Let us quickly see what is the temperature dependency of the flammability limits. As the temperature increases friends you saw in the last figure UFL and LFL decreases, UFL increases therefore the range of the flammability keeps on broadening. The flammability range therefore increases you can also work out this range from the equation shown in the slide now. Flammability also depends on pressure as pressure increases the upper flammability increases the, however the pressure has very little effect on lower flammability. This can also be directly obtained from the equation shown in the slide now where P is the absolute pressure in mega Pascal. We can also estimate flammability limits using stoichiometric balance equation for many hydrocarbon vapors. LFL and UFL are fortunately function of stoichiometric concentration CST of a given fuel. CST or the stoichiometric concentration of any fuel can be obtained from the equation shown here where 21 percent by 0 0.21 plus Z where Z is given by M plus one fourth of X plus half of Y where M, X and Y and Z will be now discussed from the stoichiometric balance equation which I will show you now. Once you have the CST value which is the stoichiometric concentration available from the equation one can compute the lower flammability and upper flammability of the given fuel 
using these two equations. Now the question comes to understand what do you mean by z, m, x and y. If you know these values from a given stoichiometric balance equation which I am going to show you now, one can easily work out the lower flammability and upper flammability mathematically. However friends for every mixture or a given fuel which is ignitable, you always have these limits available in the chemical engineering handbook in open source domain. So, for a general combustion reaction of an hydrocarbon, M stands for the concentration of carbon, X stands for the concentration of hydrogen and Y stands for the oxygen concentration and of course, Z is the value which is for the oxygen concentration. So, if you maintain a stoichiometric combustion reaction and identify the values of M, Z, X and Y from the reaction, substitute them here, you can easily find LFL and UFL of any given mixture or a fuel. Now, the point comes to understand what is stoichiometry. Stoichiometry is actually a relation between the quantities of substances that take part in a reaction or to form a compound. Typically, it is the ratio of whole integers. It is the calculation of quantitative relationships of the reactants in a given reaction and the products in a balanced chemical reaction what we call stoichiometric equation. So, LFL and UFL can also be obtained from the heat combustion equations as shown here where M, X and Y will be as same as what we explained in the last slide. As I said it is very important to also know what is the limiting oxygen concentration because below this temp oxygen concentration the fuel will not catch fire. LOC has units of percentage of moles of oxygen in a total mole. For hydrocarbons, LOC is estimated using stoichiometric balance of a combustion reaction and the LFL. Hydrocarbons plus oxygen concentration gives me the combustion products. LOC is nothing but the oxygen concentration of that of LFL. Once we know LOC, the flammability limits and the flammability region and the flash point for a given fuel either from the chemical engineering handbook or from the mathematical equations shown to you in the previous slides. Then we talk about how to plot a flammability diagram for a hydrocarbon. The diagram what you see in the slide is a typical example of a flammability diagram. I will also show you a video at the end of the slide to draw the flammability diagram, it is very important. Let us try to understand the characteristics of this diagram. This diagram essentially is a triangular in shape, has got three arms nitrogen, fuel, and oxygen. Friends, this diagram has got an order to plot. If you look at the concentration of nitrogen, fuel, and oxygen, they all vary in an anti clockwise manner. For example, the nitrogen concentration varies from 0 to 100, where nitrogen is 100 fuel starts at 0 then 0 to 100 where fuel is 100 oxygen starts at 0 and goes from 0 to 100. So, nitrogen fuel and oxygen concentrations varying from 0 to 100, 0 to 100 and 0 to 100 in an anti clockwise manner. Out of these three as you said the fire triangle similarly one arm is the fuel arm, other is oxygen arm, third is the nitrogen arm. There is something called a line which indicates an air line which is joining the apex of oxygen arm with that of 79 percent of nitrogen arm, it is not 80, it is just one line below 80. So, join the apex of oxygen with that of 79 percent of nitrogen and this line is what we call as air line. Now, the question is we should know for a given fuel how to mark the flammability zone which is hatched in the figure here. So, let us take an example and understand how to mark the flammability zone for a given fuel. Because if you know the flammability zone for a given fuel, if I am able to maintain the concentration of oxygen or the fuel or the nitrogen in a given scenario beyond the flammability region or the zone, the fuel will not catch fire. So, flammability diagram is also used for effective control of fire accidents in process industries. Flammability diagram 
determines whether a mixture is flammable or not. On the other hand, if the fuel concentration lies in the flammable region or the zone of a given flammability diagram, it is sure that the fuel will catch fire. Therefore, flammable diagrams are required for controlling or preventing accidents of flammable mixtures. Of course, it depends on chemical species, it is a function of both temperature and pressure. Now, the question interesting comes how do I draw a flammability diagram? To start with, flammable diagram is a triangular shaped figure which has got three arms nitrogen, fuel, and oxygen. The concentration of them in every arm varies in a specific style 0 to 100, 0 to 100, and 0 to 100 in an anti clockwise manner. For a given percentage fuel in air, try to mark the lower flammability and upper flammability of fuel on the air line. Now, what is an air line? Air line is a point joining the apex of oxygen to that of 79 percent on nitrogen. On the air line, mark the UFL and LFL values of the fuel percentage in air on the air line. Now, locate the stoichiometric point because you know the stoichiometric point will be the concentration of oxygen available mark that to the apex of the nitrogen point which is 100. Locate the stoichiometric point on the oxygen axis which is available for a given mixture from the chemical reaction or the combustible reaction. Draw the stoichiometric line from this point to 100 percent nitrogen apex as you see in this figure. Now, locate the limiting oxygen concentration on the oxygen axis. Now, for this example, which is drawn in the figure here, the LOC is available here and draw a line parallel to the fuel axis until it intersects the stoichiometric line join the point of intersection. So, you mark the point of limiting oxygen concentration on the oxygen arm, then draw a line parallel to the fuel arm wherever it mix it meets the stoichiometric line intersect the point and mark the region as a flammability region. Draw the LFL and BFL the pure oxygen if known then try to complete connect the points and draw a flammability diagram. We will take an example of an hydrocarbon problem which is methane which is CH4. Now, for methane the flammability characteristics are available in the literature as follows. The flammability limits in air that is lower and upper is about 5.3 and 15 fuel in air. Whereas, the flammability limits in pure oxygen is about 5.1 percent fuel in oxygen and 61 percent fuel in oxygen. The limiting oxygen concentration below which methane will not catch fire is about 12 percent of oxygen. On the other hand friends, methane requires minimum 12 percent oxygen content in a given space to catch fire. So, we know that what would be the stoichiometric general equation which is given in the slide now. Now, let us apply this equation for CH4 which is combustible reaction in our case. So, methane mixes with oxygen gets me the product as seen here comparing this equation with that of the standard stoichiometric balance equation I must estimate the values of concentration of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen and Z value from this figure. So, when you compare you will see that the Z value is becoming 2. Therefore, the stoichiometric point can be given by this equation as Z by 1 plus Z in 100 which is 66.7 percent of oxygen is the stoichiometric point of the given fuel. So, the stoichiometric point can also be experimentally established, but in this case we have used an algorithm or calculation to find out the stoichiometric point by looking at the combustion reaction of methane and looking at the weightage of the oxygen concentration in the given process that will give me the stoichiometric point for the given fuel. Once in the stoichiometric point, I draw the flammability diagram like nitrogen arm, fuel arm and oxygen arm, mark the air line which is apex or 0 of oxygen with a 79 percent of nitrogen which is called as an air line. On the air line, mark LFL and UFL of the fuel in air. You please see here 
the LFL and UFL of the fuel in air is to be marked on the airline. So, 5.3 and 15 on the airline, you just mark it here and extend it to the airline. Then you try to identify the tokyometric point, which just now we calculated 66.7 percent. You see from this equation here, mark that join with 100 of nitrogen, I get the stoichiometric line. Wherever the stoichiometric line intersects the limiting oxygen concentration. Now, limiting oxygen concentration for this chemical or this hydrocarbon is 12 percent on the oxygen arm. So, mark 12 percent on the oxygen arm, draw a line, draw a line parallel to the fuel arm. Wherever this line and the stoichiometric line intersects, mark the point and extend the LFL and UFL points. Now, you get the values intersections as A, B, C, D and E which is nothing but 5.1 percent methane and 61 percent methane on the oxygen arm which are available here. So, I mark 5.1 percent and 61 percent respectively on the oxygen arm I get these two points and preferably I get these two points intersected from the fuel arm on the airline. Of course, this point is an intersection of the stoichiometric line with that of the airline. I get now the boundary of the flammability region. Now, if I hatch this, this becomes my flammability region, which is again shown in the same manner. So, the flammability region in this specific example is what is shown between the dotted lines here. This is the line which is the limiting oxygen concentration, which is marked on the oxygen arm and line drawn parallel to the fuel arm. Flammability diagram has got an order nitrogen, fuel, and oxygen marked anti clockwise 0, 0,100, 0, 0,100, and 0, 0,100. Now, let us see a video quickly how to draw a flammability diagram. Now, what you see here in the horizontal is the nitrogen arm 0 to 100 followed by which you draw the fuel arm which is methane 0 to 100, then the oxygen arm prepare a grid, select the apex of oxygen, draw the air line, then mark the stoichiometric point, draw the stoichiometric line, mark the UFL and LFL on the air line, then also mark the LOC and draw a line parallel to the fuel arm and the intersection of this with the stoichiometry will give you the MOC, draw a line of LFL on the fuel arm and draw a line of UFL on the fuel arm mark the region of the flammability diagram. So, this is the flammability zone which the fuel concentration will catch fire. I will play this once again nitrogen arm, the fuel arm, the oxygen arm with an order anti clockwise, air line 79 percent nitrogen stoichiometric point taken from the reaction equation LFL and UFL marked on the air line, LOC marked on the oxygen arm, draw a line parallel to the fuel arm, intersection of stoichiometry will give you MOC, LFL and UFL on the oxygen arm will give me the boundaries and join this to get the flammability region, hatch them to get the flammability region is what we call as a flammability diagram. Having understood this, let us see what we mean by ignition energy. This is a minimum energy which is an input required to initiate a combustion in a given reaction. All flammable materials have something called minimum ignition energy which is available in the chemical engineering handbook which I will show you in extract in the next slide. Of course, the minimum ignition energy depends upon specific chemical or the mixture, its concentration, temperature and operational pressure. The minimum ignition energy in millijoules for different chemical is available which is extracted from a table. Let us quickly see what are the ignition sources. In general, these are the possible ignition sources in a process industry like electric, smoking, friction and overheated material, if you look at the percentage of contribution of the sources to that of fire or explosion, 
electric short circuit fitting plays a very important major contributor for any accident followed by which smoking. Therefore, if you avoid electric short circuiting by periodic inspection and proper maintenance and if you strictly adhere to the non-smoking regions in the process plants, probably you will be able to avoid fire accidents more than by about 50 percent. There are other sources which contribute to also 22 percent which can arise from unforeseen incidences. Of course, the sparks, the flames, the hot surface etcetera do also contribute substantially to close to about 20 percent. So, put together if I can avoid electric short circuiting, strictly adhere to non-smoking regions, avoid overheating of the material and be careful in not allowing any flames or sparks in the given region, I will be able to control the fire accident as close to about 70 percent in a given process industry. Explosion of course, we saw is a rapid release of energy causing development of pressure or a shock wave. Energy may be pressure energy or a chemical energy. There are different types of industrial explosion, confined vapor cloud explosion, an explosion which happens in a vessel or a given building, it is caused due to release of high pressure or chemical energy. Vapor cloud explosion which is abbreviated as VCE is an explosion caused by instantaneous burning of vapor cloud formed in air due to release of flammable chemical in the atmosphere. Boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion which is called as blevy, explosion caused due to instantaneous release of large amount of vapor through narrow opening under pressurized conditions. Vented explosion is an explosion resulting due to high speed venting of the chemical suddenly in the atmosphere. Dust explosion results from rapid combustion of fine solid particles in the atmosphere. There are different explosion characteristics which are very difficult to characterize. Explosion energy is dissipated in the form of pressure wave, projectiles, thermal radiation and acoustic energy. We have already seen a blast wave which is nothing but a shock wave in open air generally followed by a strong wind. Over pressure is the pressure of an object as a result of an impacting shock wave. Detonation is a form of explosion in which reaction front moves at a speed greater than sound in that given medium. So, reaction wave is faster than speed of sound which is called as detonation. Alternatively, there is a process called deflagration is an again an explosion in which the reaction front moves at a lesser speed than sound in a given medium. So, the fundamental difference between deflagration and detonation is the reaction waves velocity. In one case, it is much higher than sound, in the other case, it is much lower than sound. Let us quickly compare these two deflagration and detonation, both are explosions. In deflagration, reaction front moves at lesser speed than sound, whereas in detonation, it moves faster than sound. The pressure wave moves away from the reaction front at the speed of sound. Whereas, in this case the pressure wave is slightly ahead of the reaction front moving at the speed. You can see here the reaction front and the pressure front, whereas in this case the reaction front and the shock front is in the prohibited direction. If you look at the deflagration, since the velocity is lesser than sound, it creates a damage for a larger distance, whereas the shock front or detonation is an impact wave which causes explosion for a very short distance, but a very high amplitude. So, in this case the amplitude may become comparable, but the damage caused by deflagration is much larger compared to the top detonation. However, the influence of explosion on the given structure or material will be more severe and catastrophic if it is detonated compared to the top if it is deflagrated. Friends, in this lecture we discussed to understand how flammable diagrams can be plotted what are the different essential characteristics of material which can cause fire, what is a fire triangle, how flammable diagram can be intelligently intercepted to avoid fire accidents in oil and gas industries. Thank you very much.